save the best for last. <laughs> um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Vahide Manchadi. She's an associate professor of operations research at Yale, and uh, she's an expert on matching markets, platform design, and she's looked at uh, a variety of different kinds of applications in her work. And today she'll tell us about volunteer match. Thank you, Shuchi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for sticking around for the very last talk of the workshop. Really appreciate it. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, share with you joint work with three great co authors Scott Rodelitz, Daniela Sabon, and Akshaya uh, Suresh. But before telling you about our work, I want to start by making a broader point. Many of us participating in this program work on uh, online platforms, and that usually means commercial platforms. Think Uber, Airbnb, Upwork, and so on. And that's great. These platforms have given us a lot of good problems to study. But I want to highlight that similarly in the world of nonprofits, we have a lot of good platforms as well. Here I'm just showing a few, uh, a few of my favorites. We have many, many more. And I want to say that I think this is a good opportunity for us too. By studying these types of platforms, we can uh, find interesting kind of abstract research problems related to uh, data-driven decision processes, the theme of this uh, entire program. And not only that, if we take our research idea to practice, we may be able to make a positive social impact. This is the theme of this workshop, of course. Now, my plan in today's talk is to tell you about our work in collaboration with one of these uh, organizations, which is Volunteer Match, to hopefully illustrate uh, both of these two points. With that, let me tell you a little bit of background about Volunteer Match, and then I'll jump right into our research uh, question. Volunteer Match is an online matching platform, very much like Upwork. But in in, instead of helping you find a temp job, it's going to help you find an, a volunteering opportunity. It's the largest of, su largest of su such platforms that we have in the, in, in the nation with about 1.3 million monthly visitors. And it puts over 100,000 opportunities on a variety of causes ranging from hunger to education to human rights. And so it's a great platform, uh, does a great service to society, but the challenge is that currently lots of opportunities on this uh, platform do not, do not receive as many volunteer signups as they would like to. To illustrate this point, let me show you one sample of sign-up distributions. So this is a distribution of signups for 100 randomly selected opportunities that all asked for five uh, signups. Okay? Now, if you look at the left side, we see that there are lots of opportunities that do not receive five signups. So of course, that's not great. But if you look at the left, the right side, we see that we do have opportunities that receive many more than they ask for. Okay, so they ask for five, they get 30, they get 40. And this is not great either. Why? This is just congestion in kind of market design language, right? Usually volunteering requires some kind of screening process by sending so many uh, volunteers, interested volunteers to these organizations, we are gonna overburden them. And that's like at some point they're gonna stop responding to these volunteers. In turn, those volunteers are gonna be disappointed that they may get disengaged from the platform altogether, okay? So, so far we see that uh, this kind of skewed sign-up distribution is bad for these opportunities, bad for these opportunities, and bad for volunteers. And of course it's bad for volunteer match because volunteer match doesn't make as many uh, connections as it could have potentially made, okay? So based on this, our research agenda is gonna revolve around the following question. How should we design VM's platform to maximize the number of useful signups in some sense? Okay, so that's kind of our high level research question. To answer this question, uh, first we try to understand the sources of inefficiencies. What leads to this kind of skewed uh, distributions? 
And one factor that we found, which is within the control of the platform, is the effect of the recommendation algorithm or the ranking algorithm that the platform uses. Roughly speaking, uh, the platform uses a, a ranking algorithm that is kind of recency based. So it shows opportunities that have been updated or newer uh, on top of the list. Naturally, they get more attention and they get more sign. -up. And in some sense, VM ignores the kind, kind of current number of sign ups that a particular opportunity has. Okay. Now, it turns out there are some organizations out there that update their opportunities very frequently. As a result of this, they end up on the top of the list uh, quite often and they get so many excess sign ups. But based on this observation, we thought that, okay, all we need to do is add some kind of a feedback loop to take into account the current number of signups. And if you do that, maybe we are able to shift some of these excess signups to the left side of this distribution, right? That seems reasonable. But when we dug a little bit deeper to this uh, data, we saw a slightly different picture. So this is what we saw. Same distribution, I'm just color coding signups based on their sources. It turns out that on VM, there are two sources of signups, internal and external. Let me first tell you what's an external signup. These are signups that are generated by users that have direct link to a particular opportunity. Okay, so somehow I have a link to a particular opportunity page. I just go directly to that page, so I will never interact with the recommendation algorithm. So in some sense, these are uh, sign-offs from users that cannot be influenced. But we also have this internal uh, traffic. These are the default users, right? So the ones that go on volunteer match and organically look for an opportunity, so they interact with this uh, without recommendation algorithm. So again, based on this uh, digging deeper into the data, we observe this prevalence of external traffic. Let me tell you where external traffic comes from. It comes from kind of off-platform outreach activities. So it turns out organizations use volunteer match for multiple purposes. One of them is, of course, to attract volunteers, but they also use VM for uh, showcasing their products, managing relationship with volunteers and so on. And because of these other purposes, even when they attract traffic externally, they still give the link to the dedicated page on volunteer match. So let me show you one quick example. Here's an organization that publicizes its opportunity on LinkedIn, but they still give the link to this page on volunteer match. Okay. So bottom line, if I click on this, I'm never going to uh, interact with your recommendation algorithm. No matter how good of an algorithm you design, you're not going to influence my decision, right? Surprisingly, about 30% of traffic on volunteer match is actually external, okay? So a substantial amount. And as we just saw in the previous uh, histogram, in the previous slide, the amount of external traffic varies quite a bit across different opportunities. So it's not uniformly uh, distributed. And also it's of course uncertain and unknown. Question, Vahide. Yes. Um, so when you say it's unknown, at what stage do they know it? Like, is, is there at any stage before the volunteer activity itself? No, no. no not necessarily, right? So it can arrive anytime uh, before, uh, before the before the event and also lots of these opportunities are not that time sensitive in the sense that they're ongoing for a long time. Right, but good question. So feel free to ask any question also uh, following Irene's great initiative. Any question? Let me just follow up to clarify yeah. on that. Um, so this link, this like when they click in, yeah. that's this is still hosted by Volunteer Match, but they were not linking within Volunteer Match, like signups to recommendation. Right, it's just like I go here and I sign up for this or not, but I'm not gonna ask you that, hey, can you show me a list of possibilities among which I'm gonna make a selection, right? So I've decided I wanna do this one potentially, right? Great question. 
All right, good. So based on this observation, we are going to yes. Uh, so they see the recommend they see the ranking. They just decide to not. So you're saying they see the ranking, but they just decide to you know go to the website directly. Uh, no, the thing is that I am on LinkedIn. Yeah. For whatever reason, I see this. Right, I click on this, mm -hmm. go directly to this National First Responders Fund uh, page, and I never go to the main page of Volunteer Match, right? I see. But good question. Cool. Yes, Daniel. It's a bit outside of the controls that you're considering mm -hmm. in your talk, but wouldn't an option be to, if somebody goes directly to the opportunity and the opportunity is already full, mm -hmm. basically push them to, yeah, other opportunities that are similar that you might be interested in. Awesome. Is awesome that happening? Question. And if yes? Um, the, yes, I know. For certain opportunities, they come from an organization that also has a bunch of other opportunities. And usually on the kind of bottom of the page, they show those other things. As, OK, but that's a great question. I'm not considering that in my model. But <laughs> cool. So OK, let me just quickly refine my research question. Based on our observation, our refined research question is now how to make match recommendations that are useful to increase the number of useful signups in the presence of such external chat. Okay. Now, before telling you what we did with this question, let me tell you that external traffic is not limited to volunteer match. Lots of online matching platforms play dual roles. They facilitate connection, but they also facilitate transactions. And because of this second role, they attract external traffic from many different channels. Let me show you two quick examples. One from the world of retail. On Etsy, uh, artists uh, sell their products, their handmade products, but they usually advertise those products in social media, say on Instagram. As you can see, even within Instagram that they advertise it, they give the link to the page uh, on Etsy for their product. Back to the world of nonprofits, Donors Choose is a great uh, crowdfunding platform that helps high school teachers solicit donations for high school projects. And again, these teachers not only rely on Donors Choose to attract donations, they also advertise on other websites. But so again, bottom line, this kind of multi-channel traffic appears in a variety of applications, which motivates our research. And for this question, let me quickly summarize our contributions. We make two types of contributions. One is theoretical, one is applied. On the theoretical side, uh, we introduce a generalization of online matching, which is online matching with multi-channel traffic. And for this problem, we design a new algorithm that effectively uh, takes advantage of this, the external nature of this traffic. And by, by doing that, it does better than the existing algorithms. In the paper, we show that this our algorithm not only has a good kind of theoretical guarantees, but when we apply it on in a case study to VM data, it does it does pretty well on, in in practice too. Um, yes. So they think of the external traffic as predictable, uh, or is it uh, very much non stationary? Uh, no, it can be uh, arbitrary, as I will specify in the model section. Yes, there is a question in the back. I can also repeat the question. So do you consider like preferences of users for certain uh, places or like rank organizations yes. based on like their impact or something? Right, right. so that those are gonna be reflected in their uh, kind of click probabilities, right? So if I show you different things that you have different preferences for, you're gonna click on them with different properties. So that's on the theoretical side, this is our theory paper. On the applied side, uh, we proposed a new recommendation algorithm to volunteer match, which is inspired by our theory, uh, after of course taking into account uh, certain practical considerations and limitations. We worked with volunteer match to implement smart sort, that's the name of our algorithm, uh, on their platform. And we already conducted a field experiment in Dallas. So, uh, and I'm going to show you the results, which is the first time that is being presented by them. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this uh, 
it's our theoretical paper. Toward the end, I show you the results of our uh, pilot study. But before I start, any, any other question? Okay, great. So let me introduce the model. Just like a very, again, simple generalization of online matching. So I have this bipartite graph. One side is offline, which for me would be these opportunities. Each opportunity has a capacity which reflects the number of volunteers it needs. Now on the online side, volunteers are gonna arrive uh, one by one. Of course, the innovation of our work is that volunteers can be two different types. Either they are external in which they have a dedicated opportunity. We are not gonna make any decision for them. So think of them as a degree one node in your online bipartite matching problem, but a degree one node that you have to assign. So you cannot drop. Okay, so again, no decision to be made here, life is easy. But for internal traffic, once they arrive, we observe their compatibility patterns and out of all the compatible opportunities, we're going to recommend one uh, on the fly. Maybe you comment this one. And uh, of course, our goal is to uh, design algorithms that maximize the size of this matching without making any assumption about the traffic pattern. Yeah. So, so as the volunteer match, volunteer match, why should I care about the matching of the external traffic in my objective? You count like the number of external yeah, yeah, traffic. Yeah. We just want to help all of these organizations, right? You cannot count them. It's fine. It doesn't change. In the, as long as they all match, mm -hmm. you don't. It doesn't matter which which version you look at. Just to keep things simple, we keep all of them. But it doesn't matter if you don't change. As long as you don't drop them. Okay. Yes. Yes. Is there a distinction between volunteers, or is there any? It doesn't matter whether which volunteer we. Excellent, excellent. So the compatibility structure is volunteer specific, right? So each volunteer has its own edges. And actually that's a good, uh, let me follow up on that by saying that I am presenting this in the simplest possible form. So I have zero one compatibility and I'm making a single uh, opportunity recommendation. In the paper, and as I show you a little bit later, we, we do look at generalizations in which you have uh, probabilistic compatibilities, like conversion probabilities, and also I can offer you a subset, not just one opportunity. Cool. But for now, let's keep things simple. Okay. I have uh, these two types of volunteers, external ones, I don't need to do anything. Internal ones, I'm going to make one uh, match recommendation. Uh, among the compatible ones with the goal of maximizing the size of my matching. Right. Now, say I design an algorithm, how would I know if it's good? Of course, we're going to take the standard approach of competitive analysis. Now, most of you know how this works, but let me just spend a moment uh, explain what the competitive ratio analysis is. So what we do here is that you give me an algorithm, for that algorithm, I'm going to compare uh, its performance of this online algorithm that doesn't know anything about future arrivals with that of a clairvoyant solution that sees the entire sequence before making any decision. Okay. So I compute this ratio, I take the worst case over all uh, problem instances to get the competitive ratio of a particular algorithm. All right, good. Now. For a second, if I ignore external traffic altogether, again, those of you work in this area, you know that this is a very well studied problem. Uh, we know pretty much all we want to know about this problem, thanks to a very nice paper about 15 years ago by Mehta Saberi Vazirani and Vazirani. It's a real nice paper, and I'm not just saying this because one of the authors was my advisor, but uh, it was actually pretty nice and it was an influential paper, it did influence practice. Okay, what does this paper show? It shows that the best competitive ratio you can get is one minus one over E. And not only that, uh, when capacities are large, they, they gave an algorithm that uh, gives us a matching lower bound, basically achieves, the, achieves one minus one over E. Good, so again, this is for the case that I have no external traffic. 
Let me look at the, extre the other extreme in which all my traffic is external. Just to make sure who is awake and who is not. What competitive ratio would I get if all my... Okay, <laughs> good, good. So, <laughs> awesome. So I'm gonna get one. And the catch here is that uh, this external traffic by the virtue of being inflexible is going to limit the number of mistakes that an online algorithm can make compared to an offline one, okay? So it limits the power of adversaries. Now, based on this, I'm going to refine my notion of competitive ratio by parameterizing it based on a parameter beta. This parameter beta tells us what fraction of entire capacity we can fill using external traffic. Now, once you fix beta, I'm going to be looking for a worst case ratio across all instances that have this much external traffic. So again, my question is that how much, how helpful this external traffic is or what is the best we can get for different values of beta. So in order to answer this question, I'm going to first start with a warm up case. You have a question? Do we know beta? Good, good, excellent. Uh, in theory, yes. <laughs> for the algorithm we have, I'll show you. So just don't spoil my, my algorithm, okay? <laughs> Wait for it, but no, okay. I already spoiled it. Okay, okay. So, warm up case. Let's look at this super unrealistic setting in which all my external traffic arrives before the internal ones. If you think about it for a second, for the first beta fraction that are external, I'm making no mistake. My competitive ratio is one. For the rest of it, it's a typical online matching problem. Thanks to the nice paper by my advisor and his co-authors and his advisor, actually, uh, we know that we can't do better than one minus one over e. So if you think about it just a second, it's natural that uh, the upper bound is going to be simply the convex combination of these two extreme points. So it starts from one minus one over e when you have no external traffic, goes all the way to one when all your traffic is external. But if you apply MSVV just naively, it turns out that you cannot get a matching lower bound. Okay? So in the paper, we show that the MSVV cannot do better than this red curve. But if you adjust the MSVV just a little bit to get a new algorithm that we call adaptive capacity, you can again get back a, a, a matching lower bound. So the idea behind our algorithm is very simple and super natural for this special case. I, I told you again in this, in this uh, warm up case, the first beta fraction are external. So I'm going to let them arrive and fill capacities. And then once I'm done with that beta fraction, I'm just going to adjust my capacities, basically reduce my capacities. And I'm going to pretend that I have a new problem instance, run MSV. Okay. That's the idea, which gives us this matching lower bound. But the catch is that, of course, in a general case, external traffic arrives throughout. So I don't know how much I should uh, reduce my capacity a priori. What am I gonna do? I'm going to do it on the fly. So as I get external traffic, I'm going to reduce capacity. And that's the whole idea of the algorithm. Let me formalize this for you. Here's our algorithm. We have two counters for each opportunity, one for external, one for internal. For external ones, we don't do anything. If we get an external traffic, we do nothing. If we get an internal one, then we are gonna match this internal traffic to a compatible opportunity that maximizes this uh, penalty function. And the idea of this penalty function is that we're gonna penalize opportunities that have already got a bunch of uh, signups. So it is a decreasing function in both of our counters, but the whole kind of catch is that we are going to tre treat these two counters differently. And in particular, we are going to subtract the counter for external traffic from our capacity. Okay. Yes, question. Does it mean that you have to recalculate your algorithm for every external one? All um, I need to do is to increase this uh, counter. Right, so I, whenever I get a, an external traffic, I just increase the counter by one, right? 
Maybe I'll follow up on that. Yeah. Um, so in, in the actual application, do you get this external traffic information as it's coming in or is it kind of batched? Um, yeah, how frequently are you seeing? Good, good, good. That depends very much on like this, uh, your the sophistication of the technology that you use. Currently, no, it's more like kind of a daily base, daily level, okay? But again, get into all of this in kind of uh, more applied. Okay, cool. So before showing you the performance of the algorithm, I wanna make a few uh, comments. Number one, as I already told uh, to Doris, in designing this algorithm, I never use beta. So my algorithm is beta agnostic, which is great because it's it's kind of not feasible to know beta upfront in practice. Second, this is a deterministic algorithm, of course, which is usually in practice when you're dealing with practitioners, a deterministic algorithm is more desirable compared to a randomized one. And the first one I want to make is that I want to draw a quick comparison with MSVB. So MSVB does something very similar to what we do. It maximizes a potential function in case you haven't seen this algorithm before. The only difference is that it treats the two uh, uh, sources of traffic symmetrically. But now, what, what do we get for this uh, algorithm or in general case? Uh, okay. uh, uh, yes. I, I think you wanted to uh, teach us the simple version, right? <laughs> And you drop the vertex space, but if you drop the vertex space, you don't need to. I don't need the potential. Good, 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 great. That's why I kept it intentionally that uh, once you bring the weights, then you would need that expansion. And here's my but actual otherwise question. You could do balance. So my actual yes. question is, uh, if you run MSVB, how would it be different from this? MSVB uh, penalizes external traffic larger. If you compare the two fractions, mm -hmm. for MSVB is always larger than the other one. The penalty is stronger for MSVB. I see, I see. So the fraction, the kind of, you would think that you feel more of, the, more of your capacity. Okay, but great question. Cool. So this is a summary of the couple of important theorems in the paper. We show that in this general case, um, no algorithm, deterministic or randomized, can do better than this solid blue line, blue curve, I should say. It starts from one minus one over E again. It stays at one minus one over E all the way to uh, when you have beta equal one over E. And then it goes off, uh, it, it, it increases with beta all the way to one when you have a fully external track. Okay? So that's our upper bound. The kind of more important result is the lower bound we prove for adaptive capacity under the large capacity assumption. So our lower bound is uh, this dotted. Uh, blue curve, okay? So it's very close. And we conjecture that if we tighten just one part of the analysis, it's gonna be matching. But for now, the best we can show is this dotted. Uh, yes. So if you looked at the competitive ratio just over the internal traffic, if, uh, well, if all the external traffic comes first, then you're just doing MSVV on the remaining capacities yep. and you match the one minus one over E. If the traffic is in interspersed, how bad can it get? Do you have any, uh, like, uh, can, can you achieve any finite competitive ratio or? So it's like, I am taking out the constant from my numerator and denominator, right? So like, yes, I just yeah. algebraically uh, work that out. Okay, but I don't know. Uh, uh, the name of competitive ratio, you won't be able to get back to competitive. Yeah. That so you, you could construct some example where it goes to zero. Right. Okay. So again, for, a, for adaptive capacity, we prove this lower bound, uh, this dotted curve. And of course, we have, and also we show that for MSPD, we cannot do better than this uh, dotted. Okay. Bottom line, uh, by making this simple adjustment, based on the source of the traffic, we get a near optimal algorithm for any value of beta without actually needing to know the uh, value. Good. So let me spend just a moment, maybe 30 seconds on the proof. Uh, the proof relies on this uh, relatively recent framework that's called the LP3 framework for analysis of 
online algorithms developed by Rajan Odwani, who is actually at UC Berkeley and his co-authors. So this is like builds on the primal dual analysis, which is the standard method. It's just a slightly more flexible, which is useful for us because we want to define different kind of dual variables or rewards for internal and external tracking. Not going to get into any details. Instead, let me quickly talk about extensions and then move on to the applied part. So as I promised in the paper, uh, we relax the assumption that compatibility, compatibility structures is zero one. And also we are showing only a single, uh, single recommendation. We, we look at uh, stochastic reward uh, in which we have a conversion probability for every pair of volunteer and opportunities. And also we look at situations in which we offer a subset or a, a ranked list of opportunities to internal traffic. And in all of this, adaptive capacity or its natural generalization that suits that particular model still does well. And in many cases, it breaks the, this one minus one over E barriers. Okay. Yes, Doris. So, so when you, is, you saw more than one, what is the assumption about how the uh, volunteer is Maybe they go to both of them or are they? Good, good. So the, we, we have one? different choice models. So we look at kind of a general uh, choice choice model. Uh, for the subset selection, for like assortment planning, for ranking, we have a different, we have a, we look at different models for how I would search when you show me like a vertically differentiated list. So with that, let me quickly summarize the theory part and then uh, show you some experimental results. So in our theory paper, we were motivated by the design of online platforms that play dual roles of facilitating connection and transactions. And because of this, they attract traffic from different channels. So we showed that uh, by taking into account the fact that we have this external traffic and designing our algorithms, tailoring an algorithm, our algorithms to that, uh, we can get uh, near optimal performance. Uh, and the nice thing about our algorithm, which makes it practical also, is that it doesn't need to know external traffic. I want to highlight that uh, beyond kind of our modeling contribution, on a kind of more abstract uh, level, we contribute to this stream of literature that tries to break away from fully adversarial models that can sometimes be pessimistic. How do they do that? They try to come up with a more realistic and uh, motivated, well motivated uh, traffic models. I think it's a great area of research. Uh, and perhaps we need more papers in this area. Good. Future research, I think there's a lot to be done uh, on the theory side. My favorite is that what if we can design at least part of the external traffic? Tool? And it's actually motivated uh, by what we learn about VM. It turns out that volunteer match itself is active on social media and they sent out a bunch of daily emails promoting certain opportunities. So effectively, they also generate external traffic, but external traffic that is within their control. So in some sense, you can think about uh, designing uh, at this part of external traffic. But and also you can think about uh, looking at uh, different objective options. Here we just look at looked at maximizing the size of the match. With that, I want to switch gears to talk about the applied part. But before doing that, any more questions? Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on the version of the problem where the external traffic are degree two nodes? <laughs> That's a good question. External traffic is degree two not meaning that I will, how would I choose between the two? It's in your hand. It's in, in your control. So you can do, you can do whatever you want. Great. So because one way you of looking can do at a your... bit better, right? So your bounds are all going to kind of be right. dominating the ones that we have, right? And I think there is a paper that looks at the situation in which that one is, I think, assumes all the traffic is exactly. uh, D regular all yeah. the way or up to D, right? It Correct. doesn't necessarily would need to be. Um, 
yeah, I don't have any kind of like <laughs> expression or analytical results to show yeah. you, but uh, intuitively you would do slightly better than what we do. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you want to uh, kind of do this idea of decreasing capacity. Yeah. yeah, I was curious, like what's the trade off? I mean, or what's the right dependency on beta and D at the same time? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Yeah. I think that's Thanks. an excellent research question. Well, I guess a related question is yeah. uh, there's also like a, uh, I think from the same paper by like BJN07, like there's results on like if you know for, if you're guaranteed for each offline vertex, a certain fraction that's going to be matched by the end, you can get certain guarantees. So it's a bit similar in that like you're instead of external traffic, you're just told at the beginning, like the fractions that you're able to match by the end mm -hmm. for the offline, like are, are, is your model like, does the having the external traffic instead, is it like harder or easier than that model? Is your competitive ratio better or worse? Good, good. I think that it's not super compatible because uh, that's going to be a very loose bound. Like you get some lower bound of based on external traffic, but that, that can be very off, right? Compared to uh, that papers. Uh, okay, okay. But the external right? traffic essentially guarantees you that you're going to match to like, the uh, I see, but the so, external traffic, you don't know which offline vertex is going to be for. Awesome, awesome, great. So another uh, important point here is that beta only gives me a fraction over all the capacities. And in fact, if I know a priori, just how much external traffic each bin gets, I am back to my warm up case. You can get a straight line. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. Cool. So let's, one more question. Yes, 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 go ahead. So uh, what are some uh, fair allocation objectives that would be interesting for this model? You can think of uh, max min, for example. You can think like of- Like max min over groups or like- Even like you can think of individual max min if I have like, I don't know, a bunch of opportunities, I want to maximize the minimum fill rate of different opportunities, right? So that would work. But you can also try to group them somehow. Real world. <laughs> so I want to start by uh, highlighting that volunteer match currently is a very imbalanced market in the sense that we have many more opportunities than volunteers. And because of this, lots of opportunities don't get any attention for long periods of time. And that's not desirable. So after discussions, lots of discussions with volunteer match managers, we decided to focus on the goal of redistributing the limited number of weekly signups that we get to as many opportunities as we can by trying to prioritize those that are currently not getting enough attention. Okay. So toward achieving that goal, uh, we propose the smart sort, which is this real simple algorithm. So this is how it works. For every opportunity, I'm going to have a counter which keeps track of the number of signups during the last week. And going back to uh, Irene's earlier question, we can only update this on a daily basis. So we don't have real time updates. Now, each time a new volunteer shows up, we are going to uh, display to her a list, an ordered list that is ordered based on a new scoring function. This sigma i comma t. This new scoring function is a combination of our old scoring function and a penalty function. So our old scoring function, roughly speaking, is a kind of tries to capture preferences for uh, closeness and recency. Okay? So an opportunity is going to have a higher score if it is closer to this particular volunteer or it, if it has been updated more recently. And this penalty function is, of course, uh, plays the same role as it did in our theory work. It's going to penalize or deprioritize opportunities that received some signs. Let me show you a quick two example uh, that we use to convince volunteer match uh, managers and go over the mechanics of this before telling you very briefly about our pilot study. So here's a two example. Let's say I live in a ward with only two volunteers from the same location. And both of these two volunteers are only going to pay attention to the uh, top listed opportunity. Okay? 
Now, say I also have two opportunities, and based on the old scoring function, these scores are such that opportunity number one is ranked first. So this first volunteer is going to assign, is going to sign up for that. Nothing changes in my scores. So the second uh, volunteer is going to sign up for that too. This is going to lead to this kind of skewed distribution, which is kind of the toy version of the real deal I showed you at the beginning of the talk. Okay? So this is under the old scoring function. What happens under ours? So for the first volunteer, nothing. Same thing is going to happen. But now for the second volunteer, volunteer because this opportunity already received the sign up, it's going to be penalized. I cooked up these numbers such that uh, it now has a smaller score. So this other opportunity is going to be uh, shown first, which would lead to this kind of more uniform sign up distribution. A really simple example. And I want to repeat the point that many previous speakers made. If you want to communicate with practitioners, this is the level of simplicity yet that you need. Okay, so we literally showed examples of this level uh, to convince them that this idea of adding this feedback loop can be very helpful. Okay, but after convincing them and working with them for months, mm -hmm. we did implement a smart sort on volunteer match, and we ran we ran a pilot study in Dallas over summer. Our experiment was 10 weeks long, so the post-treatment is going to be 10 weeks after May 24, and we're going to take the pre-treatment to be the 10 weeks uh, prior to that, okay? Let me give you some basic statistics just to, just to get a sense of the scope of our experiment. Uh, in this pre-treatment uh, period, we had about uh, 20,000 visitors, which is roughly about 0.6% of users. Okay, so 0.6% uh, of users were exposed to our treatment. And uh, these users, again, this is pre-treatment period. These visitors generated uh, about 2,100 signups, and we had about 1,100 active or newly created opportunities. And hopefully these last two points show you how imbalanced this market is. Okay, so many opportunities did not get uh, any signups during this time period. Okay. Good. Let me show you what our treatment did. Now, we expect the effect of our treatment to be heterogeneous, right? Our goal is redistribution. So we know we are going to treat different opportunities differently. In particular, those that do well, we expect them to uh, kind of have a fewer signups, right? We expect to have a negative treatment effect because we are deprioritizing them in the hope that we're going to help a bunch of other volunteers that were not doing well uh, before our treatment. Okay? So because of this heterogeneity in treatment effect, what we're going to do is that we're going to first partition our opportunities into different groups. After doing that, we're going to basically conduct empirical analysis for each group separately. What do we do? Um, first, we're going to order our opportunities based on the average number of weekly signups they got pre-treatment. Okay, so this is basically their performance pre-treatment. We partition them into bins of size 20. You're going to take the data from uh, previous year, 2021, same region, same time period as our control. And we're going to construct synthetic controls by matching on pretreatment uh, trends, because there's a lot of seasonality there. Okay, so actually we rely on a nice a recent AER paper by Arkan Gelsky et al. Long story short, after doing this analysis for each bin separately, this is what we get. So this is the average treatment effect or the average difference in the number of weekly signups for uh, this array of different bins. What do we see? On the left side, for the opportunities that were kind of high performing before our treatment, before applying our algorithm, we see that post-treatment, we have negative uh, effect, right? So they got fewer signups. But on the other side, for those that were not doing well pre-treatment, now we help them to get uh, a few more signups. So this is kind of 
one sample of the uh, preliminary evidence we have for the redistributive effect of our policy, our algorithm. And, uh, this is again very much still work in progress, but looks quite promising. Um, just last week, we launched a second experiment, a much larger one in Southern California to fully understand the effect of our policy and also fine tune the parameters in, in, our, uh, in our algorithm. But the hope is that sometime during next year, this is gonna be rolled out uh, universally. Okay, so stay tuned for more updates on that. But on that note, uh, thank you all. I'm happy to answer any further questions. So, the, so I understand that you see this effect with respect to redistribution, which on some level should be expected, right? Because like you show those yep. things more, but uh, you yeah. do you actually see overall that more opportunities are filled or like in, in some sense, that is not the objective function, right? Good, good, good. Yes, we are not. That's that's a great question. In terms of total number of signups, we are not impacting it much. Okay, so this, we, we, we have that analysis. I didn't put it on the slides, but we are not impacting the total number of signups uh, by doing this. Okay. Clearly, if you keep showing a lot of really I don't know, unpopular or bad opportunities, then maybe the total number of signups also goes down. That's why we want to be careful in terms of like how we are doing this uh, prioritization. That's a great question. Yeah, and then Kevin, I want to know. Just kind of a follow-up question to Dana's question, like is um, the organization that you're working with, do they have, like what is their objective in using this redistribution? Is there, do they have a particular organizational level goal that makes it that benefits them to redistribute opportunities to more organizations? And is there a way to measure that goal like downstream? Good, good. So great question. So uh, just to make sure I understand the question, your question is like, what is the objective of volunteer match? Uh, in, uh, in respect to redistribution. Good, good, good. Yeah. So they want to help as many opportunities as possible and they want to keep them engaged, right? So if I, know, if I am an organization and I don't get anything out of volunteer match for six months or something, I'm going to leave. It's like, right? So that's why they like to keep their, uh, their up there. They, they like to kind of help all of their opportunities kind of on a regular basis. You, they don't want to leave someone out for a very long period of time. Okay, so that is the benefit of redistribution on a kind of weekly level, right? So we are not doing it for a very long time horizon. To answer the second part of the question, one of the measures we look at is a measure of excess, which is the fraction of total signups that go to opportunities who get at least one, right? So think about the distribution, take out one kind of a baseline for every, opportunity, for every organization, and then just compute the fraction of the rest. We call it excess. We actually show through regression analysis that we do decrease excess, meaning that we make the distribution more uniform. Um, for these opportunities, do they have capacity constraints or demands? For example, I can imagine some of them only want one person and some of them want 10 people. Does that happen in this example? And if so, how do you account for that? So does it happen in, uh, in the, by the example, you mean that I am incorporating it in my design? I mean, I mean, like um, on the volunteer match platform, yeah, yeah. do the do the opportunities, is it sort of like one opportunity corresponds to one person wanted or can they have demand for multiple people in the same opportunity? Good, good, yes, yes, they do give a, a number of requested volunteers. So, so for example, this opportunity needs five volunteers, the other one needs two volunteers and so on. So yes, we do have that information. Uh, at the moment, we're just trying to give everyone at least one on a weekly basis, right? First order.
Um, is there like a notion of preserving the overall, the long-term health of the platform in terms of maybe the high demand opportunities are just uh, better run and better organized. And so we're okay with them getting surplus sign up uh, for the lo long-term health. <laughs> good, good. Uh, for the long-term health, actually, you don't want to do that for the following reason. Uh, they're not going to reach back to the excess volunteers. Those volunteers never hear back. They get disengaged and you end up with a platform with less number of volunteers. And at the moment, I remind you, this is a, this is a market in which volunteers are very much on the short side. So you don't want to lose any volunteers. Okay, that's a good question for like a different market. Yeah. Um, so if you wanted to optimize for a sort of min-max objective, like, uh, you know, I want to fill uh, uh, every need to a certain fraction uh, and I want to maximize the, the minimum fraction I'm filling. Uh, is, that, is there something known for that, uh, for online matching? That's a good question. The thing is that balance by the virtue of kind of minimizing risk uh, by kind of balancing uh, the fill rate, it sort of automatically achieves that, right? You're ranking the algorithm achieves that. The, the basic online matching algorithm, so like that's called MSVV or our version, both of them, they try to keep fill rates relatively equally, modulo the weights, like I'm putting weights aside. That's why they kind of automatically are balanced. They, they try to kind of be fair, but that's not their objective. Right? I see. So is that, uh, I mean, can you prove that as a theorem? Uh, like, is that, uh, so if, if that were my objective, would this algorithm be uh, so, worst case optimal? Or? I have not. Uh, so here's the thing. When I have adversarial model, mean max is a very sensitive objective function. I, I bet you can cook up examples that you get nothing. But for stochastic models, I think Will has a paper on this, right? So there has been results on, for the stochastic arrival model. Okay. okay, got it. Thanks. Okay, Philip. Uh, so this is primarily about signups, right? Does volunteer match have any issues with folks signing up but not showing up for the actual event? Oh, that's and, great. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. If so, are there systematic differences between uh, the likelihood of someone to do that, given that they're an internal or an external sign up, um, or between the opportunities? That's an excellent question. Uh, think of this as a very young organization. We still don't have information on those kind of second stage uh, phases. But so they try to just create as many signups as possible. They don't have visibility to a kind of the next stage, but definitely they want to do that in the future. Uh, yeah, last question and then we'll move to the next session. Is this even feasible based on the, like, uh, will they have, can they have access to the information about who showed up to the opportunity or? Uh, not directly, but they can like ask uh, organizations to give them a follow up update. Hey, did this person show up for your uh, opportunity or not? But nothing directly for sure. Okay, let's thank Wahide again. Great. So now uh, to wrap up the work.